<laughs> Hallelujah. You got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be talking tonight about removing the self life. Oh, somebody say praise God. Ooh, praise God. God. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. You know, when Jesus walked into the water and, and said, Baptize me, John, um, he says, You, you know, I'm not, I'm not worthy of doing this. Now, what made him worthy? Well, the scripture. He says, fulfill the scripture, right? So you're worthy if you're in, in, in fulfilling the scripture. Now listen, our every day is fulfillment of scripture. We live in the prophetic. Yes. We're prophetic, not pathetic. We're prophetic Amen. people. <laughs> Praise Amen. God. Hallelujah. Now there are some people that are born again. They are Christians. And they truly are going to go to heaven. They just really don't know what a Christian life is like. And they really don't know uh, how they should be acting. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, in removing the self-life. Now, now let, me, let me have this as underlining. That it is completely, totally impossible for you to remove your self-life. Amen. Yeah, yeah. And see, that's where faith in the grace of God comes, right? Grace is the only avenue by which we can strip our natural self and allow the true identity of us to come forward and take over our natural life. Remember, we're in this world. We are not of it. Amen. And the sad thing is so many Christians uh, don't understand that. And they live their whole life here trying to be as moral as they can, trying to keep all the, uh, the, the regiments and regulations and everything. Because one of these days, when we leave this life, see, then I get to go to heaven. That's where the blessings are. That's where God has, has stored up all the things for us. But the scripture doesn't say that. The scripture actually says that we should be believing for days of heaven on earth. God wants to bring heaven to earth. He wants us to begin to open up our heart and our life and begin to live right now as if you were there because as far as God's concerned, you are. Where are you right now? We're seated in Christ at the right hand of God on the throne of righteousness. That's where we are. Now see, if you're so... Uh, Persuaded by this natural life, you'll say, no, 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 that's where I'm going. I'm here. Look at me. Touch me. I'm here. But God says, no, that's not where you are. As far as I'm concerned, you're in my son, Jesus, at my right hand. Now, let me ask you, which one of you is right? Huh? Which one of you is right? Yes, we can see ourselves, we can touch ourselves, we are in the body, in this flesh, but God has concluded us in the body of Christ, in the resurrected, glorified body of Christ. That's where the Father has concluded us, that's the reason all things are concluded in Christ, right? And so the Father has already uh, established it in himself. He can't look at it any other way, right? Why? Because he accomplished everything before he started anything, meaning that all of uh, everything that is created, right, is created for God, and it's in Christ, right? That's what the Father concludes. Now, on Jesus' side, our life is a life of faith. We need to believe that the Father is right. Yes. Right? Yes. So naturally speaking, no, we're not. But that's where we come to the place that the Spirit takes precedence over the natural. Where the Word of God takes authority over the natural. So everything that is done in the Spirit, everything that the Bible concludes about us, is a finished work. It's done. And faith sees what can't be seen. And it accounts it as real. And then it begins to manifest in this natural life. Right? Hallelujah. So, before we get too far into this, let's go ahead and go into the scripture and see what it says. Amen? 2 Peter chapter 1. <coughs> removing 
the self life. Removing the self life. Trying to work with my timer. There it goes. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I had that done. All right. First, or Second Peter chapter one, verse one. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus, and it should say the Christ. Every time you see Jesus Christ, you really need to put that word the in there, because otherwise you just call him Jesus Christ, like Christ was his last name, right? Mr. Christ. No, but it's Jesus the Christ. It's Jesus, the natural part, that was the anointing of God, the anointed of God, the Messiah, right? And if you really had kind of a Jewish mind there, then you'd really know what Messiah means, you know? And we, we kind of, in the Western world, um, just, just, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, that's the Son of God, that's, he died for me. Yes, he did, all right? But there is a significance beyond our natural thought, and that's Jesus the Christ, what Jesus, what was the man part, the human part, the Christ is the anointing, the anointed. In other words, he he was the the full embodiment of the essence of God Himself, right? And that part, he he in a sense pushed to the background and lived in a natural life with us so that he would not exercise that authority because he had to do everything that he um, is giving us to do, right? I mean, it wouldn't be fair for him uh, to have lived uh, under that power, under that anointing, that authority uh, and fullness because he was with God forever, right? And not to, um, how do I say it? not to face opposition in the natural with the human body, right? And so he did. Everything he did, he did in a fulfillment of the old covenant, right? And he fulfilled it perfectly to the letter. He didn't miss it one iota, right? And so when he was raised from the dead, then he became glorified now that treasure that was in him now swallowed him fully, right? And he sat down at the right hand of God as God's righteousness, right? So that when we accept Christ as our Savior, then we become the righteousness of God. Now that's the spirit man part of us, right? And so there is a natural part, which is our body, our body um, one day, will pick up glorification, right? But until then, if you can see it, Jesus said we can borrow his. Hallelujah. <laughs> so the effects are, are extended to us according to your faith. Now see, there's a lot of people that well, I don't believe that. It, 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 it don't matter. It, you won't be bothered with it. Right. Right? I mean, you ever notice that people that don't believe in healing, seldom get healed, they're never bothered with it. Hello? People who don't believe that God will bless you financially, they, they struggle all their life and, 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 and they're proud of it. Well, pride has no place in the kingdom of God. That's right. Right? Because they attained it in their self work. Now, when we learn how to strip the self identity off and to adhere to the Christ identity, because that's who we really are, right? And when we when we do that, when we allow the grace of God to come in and remove that, Romans 8 says, we have funeral rights. Mm -hmm. We have funeral rights, right? To what? To consider this natural life dead, right? And in a sense, it is because when you get born again, you die to self, the old nature is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. We're a spirit being a new creation in Christ Jesus, right? 
But it's like that treasure that's been hid. And it's hid in a human soul, right? So now we need to uh, allow, by faith, we allow the grace of God to cause that spirit man, that true identity, the true us, to begin to permeate through our natural being, through the soul, through the mind, the will, the emotions, the body, everything that, that you know, is the natural part of us becomes subject to the will of God, right? And that's the awesome thing, but he can only do it through first what? You've got to know what's going on, right? True. Remember Romans 10, it says uh, a, a person, how, how can they become Christ-like unless they hear about the gospel of Christ, the anointing of God, the anointed of God, right? And so they can't hear unless someone sin. And so we send them. So we don't send preachers out through the world to save people from hell. We, we should be sent to reveal righteousness. Yes. Amen. So religion has a backwards, my opinion. Religion missed it. There's a lot of people getting born again. Thank God for that. Amen. But we're doing people a disservice because we're not revealing the true, uh, how, how do we say, uh, intention of God from before the foundation of the world. Right? So that was in God's heart when he created everything. Was that we would be conformed to the expressed image of Christ himself. Now, see, we're trying to be like Jesus. Thank you, please help people across the street, open doors. To people. You know, that's not what separated Jesus from everybody else. The thing that separated him is he was the embodiment of God himself. Right? And, and it says he was the expressed image. He mirrored God in the natural. So if Jesus really didn't even say anything, he'd draw a crowd. Right? Because right. there's, there's something about him. Okay? And then it says the thing that was about him was the power demonstration. And that's what should be in all of our lives. See, but religion comes along and says, well, God just picks out a few, any, any, my, you, 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 you. You're going to be endowed with power, and you're going to raise the dead and heal the sick, and the blind will see, and the deaf, you know, and someone over here going, oh, I wish I had that, you know. But see, it's been instituted inside of each and every one of us, because he says that if you're born of God, then you will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. All you got to do is touch someone and they should recover. Bam. Yeah. Bam. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, Jesus. They shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Right? It didn't. It, it really didn't talk about a long prayer. It, it, it didn't say, you know, sit them down and give them a Bible study. You know, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong. All right? But it just said, touch them, they recover. Touch them, they recover. You ought to do that sometimes. You see someone isn't feeling good, just, just walk up and kind of touch them and say, hey, I believe everything's going to be okay. And then you just walk on. What happens? Bam. All right? Because we are the personification of God life. Yes. Hallelujah. But you need to let it out, and yes. that's where faith comes in. Now, now watch this. Simon Peter's servant... And an apostle of Jesus Christ to them. To who? To them. To them. Who is them? Who them? <laughs> huh? Who them? <laughs> it's to them. Jesus Christ. An apostle of Jesus Christ. To them. What will tell you? That have obtained like precious faith with us. Right? Mm -hmm. Now who's that? That's anybody that is born of God. Yeah. Old things passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. So he's talking about every single born again Christian. Every single person. It doesn't matter if you got born again and never did open a Bible. Born again, never did go to church. Born again, 
didn't even know that the life you're living now is unpleasing to God, right? But you're born again, you're a new creation, right? So he says that at that moment, bam, the Holy Spirit dropped precious life faith into you, right? So there's never a lack of faith. Have you ever prayed for something and then thought, you know, I guess I just don't have the faith? You know, because it doesn't seem like it happened. It doesn't seem like it worked, so I just don't have the faith. You know, no, there's never a, it's never a faith issue, right? The problem is, is that we have not been convinced and persuaded that what the gospel says is actually real and true. At best, we kind of say it's, 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 it's possible, right? It's possible. Hey, if God wanted to, Right? And then we, if God wanted to, he could make me a millionaire by the end of the week. Listen, if you only read your Bible, you'd find out that he made you a billionaire the moment you got born again. <laughs> right? He made you a trillionaire. He didn't cap it. He didn't put a limit right. on it. Where's the limit? Where's the limit? Yeah. Where's the limit? How far will your heart let you go into the finished work of Christ. Hmm? Now listen, th there's some godly people that are very blessed of God and worth a whole lot of money. But see, in reality, what to what Christ accomplished, that's repentance. That, that's nothing. You can be sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars and you're really poverty stricken in the comparison of Christ and what he opened up to us. I'm saying there's no limit. We're the limiters, right? Right. But see, you'll never experience some of that out of the boundaries, out of the box manifestations of the things of God until you start listening to the Holy Spirit, till you start looking at the gospel, till you start seeing this vastness that God has brought us into. And in his own righteousness, he refuses to limit you. He refuses. See, you hear people all the time, you know, well, I guess, but God said, no, I, I you know, God never says no. God doesn't know what no is when it comes to what Christ has already freely given us. There's no limitation. Hallelujah. Are you ready? We need to get into this. Now watch this. He says that have came like precious faith. Like precious means we have the exact equal quantity and quality of persuasion and trust of God's love and acceptance without partiality or respect of persons in our heart, right? So what he's saying is that in order for you to start opening up and to step in to this persuasion of who God already concluded this, you have got to allow the Holy Spirit to remove all your judgments mm -hmm. against any and every body. Mm -hmm. Help me, Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Right? How many of you know it's not hard to not like some people? <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, remember Jesus when he, when he told Peter and them, he says, well, give us faith. <laughs> right? He says, how often do I forgive my brother? You know, seven times? And that was Peter was saying, like, you know what? I'll never hit seven, but I'll throw it out there. <laughs> seven times? Because by six, you're dead. <laughs> right? And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. Can you imagine Peter when he went? What he said, you just threw me into an impossible state. And that's exactly what God wants us to conclude. We've been thrown into an impossible place. 
You cannot do it. Right. right? And so you try to be nice to everybody, but what you end up doing is kind of separating yourself to people that are more like you. Right. You're right. Anyway, moving right, right along. Right. Now watch this. He says, like precious faith with us, how does this come? Through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Through the righteousness means the equitable judgment of a just God. So if we've been made the righteousness of God by the shed blood of Christ, not anything that we've done, it was a gift, a gift of righteousness. God concluded us righteous, right? Anything we could do. To do it. So there isn't anything we can do to attain that or to release it in the natural. You know, why? Because at our best, we're still self-centered. We're still selfish. Now, if you would think of a person, a human being, right, that is the least sinful of anyone that you, you, you could possibly think of, you would have to think of a brand new born baby. Right? Fresh from the moon. <laughs> That's about the best you'll ever be. Because then life starts. And listen, after a couple of minutes, you own mama. You control everyone around you. Right? Yeah. So from the get-go, whatever you want and need, everyone fusses over you to get it. Right? And that's from the, the most sinless human being possible. Now, think where you are now. Since you're not a newborn baby. Since you've had a lot of, a lot of experience in life. And every day we just fatten and add to self-centeredness selfishness, right? So we come to places that we begin to shed some of that because we begin to, you know, give our life to Christ. We go to church. We're being polite. We're being nice. We're being whatever. But don't raise your hand. But how many of you know there's those times? And hopefully not when too many people are around. <laughs> come on. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay? And it's not hard to be nice to people you like right. and people you respect and people you admire, right? I mean, you can respect and admire someone to the point that they can use or abuse you and you'll just set it aside, right? Amen? So how many of you know this that it's easier to forgive someone you don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I've never met. Yeah. <laughs> or a stranger, right? <clears throat> you know, someone that cuts you off in the lane. Why are you? Oh, sorry, Lord. Pray for them. <laughs> forgive them. But then let someone in your own household do something. <laughs> anyway, moving right along. <laughs> Verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace and peace what? Be multiplied. Mm. Be multiplied. Think about this. Mm. We've received everything from God, and yet it can be multiplied. Right? Mm -hmm. Now look at this. If you want the grace and the peace of God, the grace is what? Grace is a divine godly influence on your heart, enabling you to do what is impossible for you to do, right? Because if you can do it, you don't need grace. So the grace of God is more in the condition of our heart, working with that, opening us up, removing the self-life, 
so that we could readily, openly accept and receive the finished work of Christ and believe we are who he says we are. All right? I are victorious. <laughs> Amen? In all things. But that's where confession, true confession, really comes out. It isn't like confess it till you possess it. You know, No, it's confessing, it's, it's stating a truth. A truth of something that you can't attain by any natural means, right? So I can confess for a car, you know, but but I can get a car. It may take me a while or whatever it is, but I, I can get it. Mm -hmm. God doesn't even have to help me, mm -hmm. right? But what can't I do? Well, I can't change my heart. Right. It's the subconscious. I don't even know what's there, right? right? And when I try to die to self, I have to resurrect self in order to kill self. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. Right? So you can't. It's impossible for you to die to self. It's impossible for you to strip the self life. It's impossible for you to let the Christ life take over and live through you of your own ability because that's natural. And nothing natural will produce anything spiritual. Right. Right? right? Now watch this. This is getting awesome. Are you getting something? Yes. He says, through the righteousness, which is the equitable judgment of a just God, we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ by faith in Christ's blood. Right? So when, when we believe that Christ spilled his blood, for us, and we accept that. You know, we call it soul cleansing, right? It removes the sin. Well, how does it remove the sin? I mean, is it like turpentine or something? You know, you get, you get a brush and, you know, take out a stain or what? How does it remove sin? Well, Jesus died and he shed his blood, so therefore my sin has been forgiven, right? How? Very simple. It kills you first. And once you're dead, no sin lives. Right? No dead person ever sinned. Amen. Right? We become a new creation in Christ. So when you become born again, when you become a new creation, there's no more sin. Right? And that's who we're dealing with is the Christ in us and the new life in us. And so you, you've got to understand that we are spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. Spirit, soul, body. Spirit, soul, body. So the gospel, the teachings of, of Paul and, and of Peter and them, is talking about the spirit man, the new creation, the hidden man of the heart, the true identity, who you really are. So when it says that we cannot sin if we're born of God, it's talking about that sin, you know, that spirit, uh, new creation in there is incapable of sinning, right? And so God has concluded us complete in Christ, meaning that God himself has separated your natural life from your spirit life. And he only sees your spiritual life. Hallelujah. Praise God. Somebody say amen. 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 Now, we still deal with consequences. We can still miss it. We can still do things that we shouldn't be doing. We can have wrong attitudes. We can get upset. We can, I'm just, there, there, you know, a, mirad, a, a myriad of, of things, right? But we're not dealing with a judgment from God anymore. We're dealing with consequences in our natural life. Don't raise your hand on this, but how many of you have done something you shouldn't have and you've ended up paying a price that has cost you more than you thought it would? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as far as some people's concerned, you'll never <laughs> be free from that debt. <clears throat> Amen? But see, God has concluded us in Christ to be sinless. We're free. So when it's talking about sinless, when it's talking about righteousness, 
when he's talking about glorified, he's talking about the part hidden in Christ, right? And that's the important part because that's your testimony before God, not your natural life. So does it mean that you can just go out and do whatever you want because it isn't going to matter? No, you miss the whole gospel. You miss the gospel. What's the blood? The blood didn't just you know, remove you from hell, right? The blood made you righteous so that you could live a righteous life here in this flesh. One of the greatest accomplishments that can be done. Once you leave this earth and go to heaven, everything's over. Everything's over. You'll never add to your faith. You'll never, you know, you, you'll add to your knowledge, right? Because it says that God is going to unfold things for eternity, you know, to us, right? But faith is here. We exercise faith here. And so that's why it's so important to stand on who you are in Christ and to re receive that transformation of the spirit life into us. Stripping the natural life, pushing it out, enforcing our funeral rites on our natural life. And so it, it goes way beyond morality. It, it isn't even about morality. Meaning this, that you become more moral than you've ever been in your life by accident than you've ever done on purpose. Because you realize who you are in Christ. Yes. Right? When, when, when the eyes of your understanding open up and you see what is available to us through Christ, there is nothing in this world that can compare. And it's much easier to nullify and to deaden and to put to death the lusts and desires of the natural self in the light of something so glorious, right? And so most Christians are trying to do it through abstinence. And that works all right, unless you get into a place where you think that nobody will know. Right. <laughs> or nobody will find out, right? And there's been a lot of people got in those places. Now, now watch this. He says, what God bestows or presents to one he does it for all because righteousness could do no less. Right? So who is separating us from, from, from the, 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 the uh, Billy Grahams and, the, and Kenneth Copeland and, 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 and you know, whoever it is in, in like in, from Paul or from whoever it is. See, it's us. You know, why do we separate ourselves and see how some people are being more mightily used of God than we are, mm -hmm. right? Now, you got to catch this. It's because we have an inaccurate understanding of our identity, right? Now, this is, this is where the Holy Spirit was ministering to me today, and, and this is what I, I wanted to preach, but, but the Lord, you know, moved me over here. So, so he said I could throw in a tidbit. All right. <laughs> All right. Here's the, let me ask you a question. What is a curse? Did you ever curse something? Yeah, well, you certainly did before you accepted Christ. Yeah. All right. What is a curse? What is a curse? You know, is, is it is it? A little voodoo doll with a pen. What is a curse? It's really a simple answer, but but when you see it, it's like, who? Oh. Right? A curse is this. We could say a curse is something that is absent from the blessing. He says what? Bless, curse not. Right? Remember Balaam? And they, they paid him off, you know, and curse Israel. And, and, and he'd go to God and he'd offer sacrifices and everything. And God would say, I cannot curse what I have blessed. And so he told me, he says, can't do it. Doesn't matter. We'll, we'll, we'll offer you more money. We'll, we'll, what do you need? What do you? He said, you don't get it. Those who God has blessed 
are blessed, it cannot be reversed. A blessing is what? Unchangeable, irrefutable, and lasts through human history. Right? Ephesians says we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Those are the spiritual ones. They're what? Unchangeable, irrefutable, and will last throughout human history. At least our history. Mm -hmm. Right? And those are the spiritual blessings. Well, then we've got to conclude what's more important, the natural or the spiritual? What's more valuable, the natural or the spiritual? The spiritual. Right? So, if we conclude that we are the blessed of God, everything in this natural world would come, become subservient to you. Mm -hmm. But religion has taught us not to believe. What do we do? We're around and, and waiting for God, you know, to, to throw down a tidbit. Waiting for God to bless us or something like that. When we are the blessed of God. Yes. We were born to be blessed. Yes. We were born to be a blessing. So there's a flow that's there. It has nothing to do with get your buckets out and fill them up as much as you can. The blessings of God are being poured out. You know? The blessings of God are being poured through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So we got to change. we got to look at ourselves and say it isn't about what is my right, what my benefit is as being a Christian born of God. It's who is God trying to get to through me? And I'll tell you this. God will give you a billion dollars to reach one person on a beach in Maui. Because one soul is more valuable than the wealth of the world. Yes. So we don't see it. Why? Because we still have natural thinking. Natural thing. Why would God give you a billion dollars to reach one person? It would only take, you know, 10,000. You can fly your first class and just go down there and tell them. Right? See, God is not you and you are not God. Mm -hmm. Right? Why would God fill this earth with enough gold and silver and, and valuable things and everything that... that that, that could last a million years and yet it's only going to be a few thousand that we're going to use it. <clears throat> right? That's going to be over. Because he's extravagant. Yeah. He's extravagant. But he's not wasteful. Right? Now look at this. He says it's multiplied. Grace and peace be multiplied. Don't you like multiplication? when it comes to good things. Yeah. Grace and peace. Grace is what? The influence of God on your heart enabling you to do what you can't do naturally. Peace is what? It's, it's basically full-blown prosperity in every realm of existence. Right? Nothing missing, nothing broken. Okay? So it's multiplied through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now look at this. He said multiplied through knowledge. So it's increased, and the word knowledge is epinosis, which literally isn't about information. Epinosis deals with relationship and fellowship, not information. Right? Let, let me put it this way. Somebody could come along and, and, and write a biography book about Nancy and just fill it full of stuff that I forgot or don't know or haven't figured out yet. And they could know every single thing. Okay? But they'll never know her like I do. Right. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah. We have relationship. Hi, hon. <laughs> <laughs> we have fellowship. Yeah. Okay? So it's, it's more, it, we use it in the connotation of intimacy. Right? But it's beyond that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay? Remember when the angel Gabriel came to, to marry a young girl and said, you're going to be found with child? Mm -hmm. And she says, how can this be? I've, I've never known a man. And we look at him saying, 
I've never had intimate relationships with a man. Okay, so how is this going to happen? Well, it wasn't about whether she had intimacy, whether she had uh, a sexual um, relationship or something with a man, right? That wasn't it, okay? She's saying, I, I, I don't know a man. In other words, I, I, I'm not experiencing man, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it isn't just the, the, um, the physical act, right? But it's something that's more. It's the muting of two together that the two shall be one, right? So basically she was saying that, that, that without that, that muting together of the two becoming one, right? That's what brings forth the, the legitimacy, 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 <laughs> legally, <laughs> of the physical relationship. Genuine. You got it? It is genuine. Right? Okay. See, anybody can have sex. Right. And any two people can produce a baby. Right? But that's not the relationship fellowship that came out of the heart of God right. in the beginning when he made man and took woman out of him and called their name Adam, right? And this is what she was saying, right? So it wasn't, you know, that she didn't have some physical relationship. She says, I am not place back inside the man. Right? How will it be? Well, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you'll be found with this child. Right? And so it's this in intimacy is, is not, just, not just personal relationship, but it is a 100% of giving self to another and the receiving of 100% of another to yourself, right? To where there's no distinction and the whole identification changes. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. this, is what, this is what this knowledge is, right? Now, with that in mind, now, now watch, watch what it says. It says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through this interaction and muting and the 100% of giving of ourselves to Christ and Christ to us, right? That what? You come into a place where there's no distinction. Oh, man. No distinction. No distinction, right? He says, he says, uh, verse 3 he says according how does this happen according as his divine power divine is God God well, when you look at God it isn't that he's bigger than everybody you know whatever it is see God means this nothing natural Right? That's what spirit is. It's nothing natural. Remember our basic building blocks? What is natural is not spiritual. What is spiritual is not natural. And never shall the twain meet. Right? And that's what we have to see. What we try to do is bridge the gap with morality, bridge the gap with knowledge and understanding, Bridge the gap with you're okay, I'm okay, right? And it's never bridge. Christ is the bridge, right? And so this immutable truth that he becomes us and we become him, we're blended in that place in the spirit, right? Now, like I said, God has concluded all things in Christ. Now, naturally, we still have our physical being. We still deal with natural things, right? And ramifications and, and consequences and, and things like that. But none of those 
have to operate and work because the natural does not dictate us anymore. Why? Because the death, the, the death of the the unborn again spirit man, right, just uh, took away all the, the the authority of the natural in your life. You become a new creation in Christ. Your spirit being is one with God, right? And there's no difference. We say. I'm a spirit. I am a spirit. I am a spirit. See, but there's really only one spirit. And God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Christ, and us, it's all blended and muted. It's one. There's no variation. It's one identification. Right? That's the reason Jesus says, you see me, you see the Father. Yes. Right? Be you holy as I am holy. Right? And, and, and so we see in spirit, there's just this oneness. It's all blended, right? So if God is righteous, everything in spirit is righteous in Christ, right? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Then we have the natural side. The natural side is what? That we have laid on an altar and we become living sacrifices. That by the blood of Christ and the exercise of our faith in grace, that there is a transformation of the flesh. It's being inoculated. Right? And it says that there's something inside of us called righteousness and glorification. That is, that is like, like yeast that you put in dough. And, and, and you put it in one little corner and it is going to work all the way through that dough, right? Righteousness is working all the way through us, right? Amen. Now watch this. He says, according as his divine power have given, past tense, have given. Now, now, here's, here's an interesting thing because you have you, you have a, 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 a verb that's past, right? And then you have given that is present, right? So you have a past act that is presently being enforced, right? And in the Greek, it's a perfect participle, meaning this, that not only was it an act that happened in the past, but it affects the present and it perpetuates into the future, meaning never change, never change, never change. Even when I don't see it, you see it working, right? It never changes. So you may change your natural life. You may doubt the things of God. You may get offended. You may get whatever in the natural that closes off your, re your receiving of it, your reception of it, but it doesn't change. Right. It's like a river that just keeps on flowing. You can go off and get into the desert and die of thirst, but the river kept flowing. Right. right? And this is the blessing of God. This is the fullness of Christ. This is the life of God that is coming into us. That is what begins to wash away the self-life. Mm -hmm. Not through your abstinence, not through your effort of trying to change, but it's just the opening up and accepting the grace of God, accepting the peace of God, accepting the righteousness of God, accepting the full work of the blood, letting the Holy Spirit just work in us, and He washes those things away. The Bible calls it the regeneration by the washing of the water of the word. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why we meditate in scriptures and things. It isn't, it isn't, bless God, my stripes on here. It isn't to get healing. Listen, if you understood who you were, you would never try to get healed. Because your health would be too strong in your life. For any sickness to get hold. Right. Right? 
Hallelujah. Listen, we wouldn't be believing for money. We'd be trying to give away all that keeps coming. Why? Because when you give it away, it creates, it's a magnet flow wow. through you. So if you're exercising, sowing, and reaping and stuff, you know, to stuff your coffers and, you know, get a big bank account, you've missed the whole thing, right? See, you're, 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 you're carrying bucket loads of water out into your little pond. And some people got some pretty big ponds. But listen, it'll never, it'll never compare to that mighty river yes. that just keeps on flowing. Amen. And so what you do is you say, that's me. That's me. The flow. The flow. Right? And it comes by the grace of God. Your mind will never capture it. It'll never understand it. It'll never use it. Right? It's by grace. It's God's power. God's ability. That's why it's an effortless change because it's the Spirit of God that is constantly at work inside you bringing you to a place that you can freely open up and accept and receive all that Christ has given. Right? See, he didn't say, okay, I accomplished 40 billion things and there's already been 39 and a half billion people that have come and gone, you know, so there's, there's a half a billion people left and so I only have this much left. You know, no, we, we got the whole thing mixed up. He gives everything to everyone. Right? Mm -hmm. Now watch this. Oh, it gets better. <laughs> he says, pertaining unto life and godliness through, there again, epinosis of him. So, so basically, we need to understand who we are in Christ. We need to read the gospel. We need to study. We need to meditate. We need to pray in the spirit. See, but all of this is going to be a byproduct of our love affair with Christ. You become so in love, so involved, full of such honor and praising him and magnifying him to the place that you can't, you can't even hardly say his name without just breaking up because he's Christ. He's God. He's the Lord, right? So the natural self comes in and, and starts dulling your heart, dulling your senses. Oh, yeah, Jesus, praise God, I love him. You know? No. 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 You know, I had chocolate once. I like it. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> it isn't the same. He's what? The Christ. Remember we said, who do men say that I am? Okay, well, you're Elijah that come back. You know, you're Isaiah. You're, you know, and he says, whoa, 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 whoa. Who do you say I am? Mm -hmm. Thou art the Christ. Right? How did Peter come up with that? Well, it says, you know, Jesus looked at me. <laughs> he looked up at the Father and said, you know, my Father showed you that. <laughs> Basically, you had no clue, Peter. Right. You had no clue. You you don't even know what you said, right? Thou art the Christ. You know, if, if we would just allow the Holy Spirit to begin to infatuate us and present us as that bride, right? And that excitement and that thrill of your heart you, you know uh, did you feel that oh it's the Lord you know remember when everything was just so dramatic and so awesome right and so <laughs> I had a hand now and they got healed it's not praise Yeah, we had three people, blind eyes open, and you know, we had someone raised from the dead, and that's pretty good. Ah, man, the last night where we were, let me tell you, you know, it, it, the human heart and brain 
just removes us from the intimate excitement that should be overpowering us. Yes. Amen. Should be consuming us. Yeah. Right? Yes. Now watch this. He says, according to his divine power. The power is, is dunamis, which literally means inherent creative ability. It, it's 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 power that that creates within itself. And it's not it's not because someone said something or whatever. It's power. The power of God is the power behind creation, right? And He placed it in us. And whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, a whole lot of your life was created by you. And even the things you didn't want, mm -hmm. you brought in. Because fear works as a magnet, as well as faith. Yeah. So that's the reason he wants us to be bold. Start creating your world. Start creating your life. Start speaking it and telling it, right? And do it from the spirit realm into the natural, not from the natural trying to get the spiritual to agree with you. Right? Why? Because we're raised up. We're seated in he heavenly places. Right? And the view from way up here is really nice. <laughs> Amen? Now watch this. Are you getting something? Mm -hmm. He says, uh, and he has called us. Now listen, this is Bible. This is Bible. He, God, has called us to glory and virtue. Called us to it. Called us to it. There's an invitation to glory. An invitation to glory. What is glory? Glory is, is the divineness. Glory is the honor. Glory is the value. It's the wealth. Right? It's, it's the, the manifested perfection and moral goodness of excellence. Is that awesome? And he called us into it. Right? Meaning what? He's going to do it. That's his work. We say, have at it. Have at it. And we work with him. Right? Now watch this. He's called us into glory and virtue, whereby are given whereby are given us exceeding great precious promises that by these we might be partakers of that divine nature. The divine nature means the Godhead germination and growth in the same likeness. All right? And so that's what the seed, the precious seed that came from the loins of God that recreated us into a new creation is still at work. And the work that it's doing now by the grace of God is the stripping and the removing of what's natural. Right? So that all that's left is spiritual. Lord. What? I must decrease that he will increase. Right? And that's what's taking place. All right. Anybody ever plant a plant from a seed? Okay. And, and then you basically had nothing to do with it. Right. I mean, you put it in soil and you watered it and you, you kind of took care of it. But, but you didn't come on, get a seed. You know, get that little root out there. You know, it, 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 first thing it did is you killed it. Right. That's the first act. Yeah. You know, and once it was dead, then life sprung out of it. Right? The precious seed of God on the inside of us first killed us. Right? And then that seed broke out and began to germinate. And it's trying to grow in the fertile ground of your heart because it wants to transform you and change you so that no one will recognize you anymore. Right? And it will even change your physical appearance. Once we get to the place, it'll wipe away years. You know, there are no impossibilities. We're stepping yes. into something that is so God. Yes. That it's around 
of, uh, of, of unimaginable possibilities that's there. Now listen to this. He said what? There are no possibilities to him that believes. Any possibility that you're not seeing happening in your life is you haven't been persuaded yet. If you haven't heard of it, then you'll never accept it. So you got to hear it. you got to make yourself available to yeah. the truth and the reality of God and what his intention for you is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I'm not talking about, does he want to send you to Africa? Or is it, you know, like, no, it's you in your heart to become Christ-like. Now look at this. He says, he says, uh, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. For if these things mm -hmm. be in you and abound, yes. they, they, did you get it? They, not you, they will make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge that intimate relationship, fellowship, the, the immutability, the blending of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Give all diligence. Giving all diligence means bring alongside with energetic quickness. That's what diligence is. Energetic quickness. The more knowledgeable people get of the Bible, the less energetic they become. Hmm. Can we say it this way? The more kids you have, the less excited you are of giving birth. <laughs> True. Uh, come on. But he's saying what? Be energetic. Praise God. Can you imagine what God's going to do tomorrow? You know? So what's this whole COVID and everything is? It, it's smoke and mirrors. Yes. yes. Right? And we got to be smarter than that. We're not rebellious. We're just smart. Well, we just fight that said, You know, it, it, it's like the matador with, with the bull. Right? The bull's out there, you know, and and you just push the back. You know, why? Because there's something awesome that is already taking place. It's already transpiring. And this is the devil's uh, failed attempt to sidetrack the church. Yeah. Well, they're right. Working. They're working. Because it isn't, it isn't so much about whether we can meet together, whether we can sing, whether we can... It isn't that. Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know what's going on, the transformation inside your heart, that the Christness is working its way out? Listen, if the devil couldn't handle one Jesus, what is he going to do with a million of them? Amen. Right. Huh? And he's found that the best way to stump the growth is through religion. Mm -hmm. yep. Man's religion. Yep. Man's opinion. Man's attempt to do and become what God said. Right? Notice. He said, what do you do? Be quick. For the virtue, virtue is moral excellence or divine energy. What do you add to it? Knowledge. Knowledge is what? It's basic information. You've got to have information. Energetically accepting information, right? And to that you add temperance, which is self-control. Now, self-control is not controlling self. Self-control is the eliminating of self. Yeah. Right? Now, we've got to control self. No, kill it. <laughs> <laughs> Kill it. Get rid of it. And, and to that self-control, what well, patience? Patience is consistency. You're consistent day in, day out. Every second, every minute, every hour. I'm righteous. I will not back down. I refuse to fear. Right? To consistency, what do you add? Godliness. What is godliness? It's a God attitude. Think like God. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ. 
I'm a dark man. To a God attitude, add brotherly kindness. That means, you'll love this one. Brotherly kindness means out of the same womb affection. Wow. Do you realize that everyone that is born again came out of the same womb? <laughs> and God wants us to be affectionate to everyone that came out of that womb. Yeah, but they're idiots! That's not affection. Love never fails. Affection is like that leaven, you know, that just works its way in. Hallelujah. Why? God's going to get you. God's going to get you. See, I used, to, I used to say, I don't understand Christians. Duh. <laughs> right? But he didn't tell me understand. He said what? Be affectionate. Be affectionate. And you know what? When I'm affectionate, when I have affection toward other people, I may consider ignorant or whatever it is. But see, it doesn't do anything for them, but it changes me. Mm -hmm. Then I begin to realize, oh, it's, it's about me. See, the Holy Spirit is doing the work in me. Mm -hmm. Me forgiving you may not even affect you ever, but it'll work in me. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when I harbor your feelings and, 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 and uh, things against people and stuff, it, it, it uh, hardens my heart. I become less sensitive. I become calloused. And he's one fertile ground. Fertile ground. Because you know what? No matter what somebody does to me, in a thousand years, what is it going to matter? In a million years, what is it going to matter? It will matter. If it won't matter in a million years, why should it matter right now? Let go. Let go and get on with life. Right? Why? Because that's a little bit of that self that he's trying to remove. Right? Let him. And to that, it brings God love. And added to God love is what? Knowledge. And that word knowledge there just means a full recognition. So it goes beyond an intimacy, fellowship. It goes to a full recognition of the Christ. You are the Christ. You're the Christ. Why should I be afraid? Why should I fear what man might do? Why should I even give a thought to something that isn't Christ-like, something that isn't part of, uh, of our ongoing salvation and work and everything? Because everything that is contrary will take you away from it, and you will not be fully persuaded. We have to be fully persuaded that transformation is working on the inside of us. Okay. See me how I am? <laughs> say goodbye because this is the last time you'll see that. <laughs> because something's going on in inside of me. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's effortless. It's working. <laughs> That's why getting up in the morning is so exciting because we get to wake up with the new us every morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.